Hello, everyone. We really appreciate y'all listening uh, to our little podcast. Um, you know, it's 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 been really fun for Brendan and I to grow together and figure out how to do this thing. And obviously, we have a long way to go to make this uh, um, as good as it could be. But we, you know, any little support we can get is uh, super helpful. We're not really even asking for any money from you guys, but it really helps us if you could uh, subscribe to our YouTube page. Um, we can leave a link in the description for you. Uh, it's Mushing Alaska Podcast, right? Brennan, mushing.alaska.podcast. Correct. Um, and, you know, just, you should, wait, here's what you should do. All right. You just take your friend's phone, you know, you, you just go to their YouTube account and you just click subscribe on that. You know, they won't even notice. All right. Because, you know, I don't even know which YouTube channels I'm subscribed to, you know, just like, Hey, grab your, grab grandma's phone. Look this. I don't know if this is legal, but you just grab grandma's phone. Grandma's not on YouTube. She's got an iPhone. Why as well just click that subscribe, get your boy an extra sub. All right. Because we can get monetized here. We can get, we can actually make, we can make up to 0. 0.0001 cent per view on this. And that could be enough for Brennan and I to potentially buy one piece of gum. So if you guys subscribe, we really appreciate you listening. That's already enough. Uh, but if you find yourself with 30 seconds to kill, and you want to do us a favor, go to that YouTube page, click subscribe. We really appreciate it. Thanks for listening. Hope you enjoy. All righty, folks, welcome back to the Mushing Alaska podcast. We're your hosts, Brendan and Sean, and we're excited to bring you our next episode. Um, before we bring on our guests, I just want to make a quick reminder uh, for those of you who haven't uh, check out our YouTube page. Uh, please give us a follow and like. Um, we've been putting all of our podcasts as of lately on YouTube so that you can watch them as well. Um, and then we're also going to be putting some clips together and having some fun other videos as well. So be on the lookout there. We appreciate everyone's love and support. And uh, well, without further ado, we'll move into our actual programming and um, very excited to have Anna and Christy Barrington on the podcast today. Uh, so welcome on. And how are y'all doing? Good. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Definitely. Sean, uh, do you have like a little uh, intro or anything? I you mean, wanna, I can, I, I, you know? I'll say, you know, you guys, y'all have run, Anna and Christy have run, you know, what, 26 combined Iditarods? Am I right on that? Yeah. Uh, and that's a, that's a lot of Iditarods. Uh, and, you know, have been the face of uh, one of the faces of, or two of the faces of mushing for, you know, over a decade. And, um, and you know it's they've just always fun to just a, a totally different kind of uh you know fame that you guys bring to the with your being twins and you guys kind of run the race together you know um i think we're, i think i can speak for myself at least that uh i'm not probably not the only one that's jealous that you guys are running together and to get to be like out there with your probably your you guys y'all are i'm assuming best friends and your your sister and you guys do a lot everything a lot of things together at least and you know that's got to be pretty awesome to be able to not to be able to share this experience with each other right i mean how how awesome is it getting choosing to go down the trail um as a brace of teams Oh, it's a lot of fun. I think, like you said, some people are a little jealous of it because they like <laughs> see that it's having so much fun. And, you know, it gets hard out there and things get, you go up and down and that kind of stuff. And some people are pushing really hard and being super competitive. And, you know, I mean, kind of no matter what the outcome, we're having a good time. And I think some people are jealous of that. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And Ann and I are running together. I get to see all 28 of our dogs out on the trail, not just what's in front of me. Cause I can turn around and see her dogs are we're camping, you know, together and I get to go say hi to, you know, some of my other favorite dogs. So it's really nice to, to have us all together as a group. Yeah. I, you know, looking back on, uh, 
on I'm thinking back to running some of these races. Something I wish I would have done anytime I got it talked to by a volunteer interviewed or something is just like, Hey, bef- could you mind just giving me a quick hug? Cause I kind of need a hug right now, you know, <laughs> yeah. but you guys, I mean, what's the over under on total hugs that you guys give each other? Like, it's been a long day. Just bring it in. Come on. You know, <laughs> nope, no hugs. <laughs> no, there's definitely hugs and stuff. It just it hits you at different times and in different ways of sometimes it sucker punches you of this huge emotional feeling of, gosh, look at us out here, you know, you've been playing together, pretending mushing since we were little kids and look, we're in the middle of Alaska doing this and you know, you're out, you're choking up a little and like, this is incredibly amazing. And then, you know, hug. Yeah. You know, sister Mm -hmm. power and all that stuff. And then other times, you know, I might be super bummed out like, Oh man, like this year I had to drop one of my good leaders in white mountain Yondu. And I was like, dang it. I got to return Yondu and stuff, you know, hug from Chrissy. It's like, it's okay. We only, we got, all together, lots of leaders, it's a good time and that kind of thing. So then different reason for a hug. So there's lots of different reasons for just hugs and high fives and all that stuff. Yeah. Well, uh, two years ago, we started, you decided since we had our cell phones, others like, let's take a selfie at every rest stop, every checkpoint we're at and every, you know, camp out. And it was fun to see just the, the trail wearing on you. And also <laughs> we, decided we were in an Ofer and the little wall tents there. And I had my phone on video on accident of us doing a selfie and we both just lost it because we were making this silly face and to go back and see us with our arm around each other and trying to keep a straight face for this Mm -hmm. selfie it's hilarious and anytime i'm down i can just watch that movie and be like oh yeah yeah Yeah. things are gonna be better nice that's 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 pretty funny i definitely love that's like one of the best pranks you can pull on your friends you're like all right i'm taking a picture one two three click and then just leave it recording for like seven yeah. seconds and don't say anything <laughs> uh what uh so christy didn't you run a couple i did odds before anna did is my am I right or is yeah i got the opportunity to do that so yeah i have a couple more ahead of her and the i did a rod tally and was that, were y'all still like mushing together at that point? You're like, Anna, were you, were you kind of helping that happen? Or, you know, obviously getting two, one team into the Iditarod is miraculous enough. And you guys having pulled off getting two teams in the race for 12 straight years is insane. So I guess the first couple of years, you know, uh, you had to go one, one, st- one at a time. Yeah. Well, in the beginning years, we were working with other kennels. So um, we both, we're working at Dean Osmar's kennel and then Dean didn't need two handlers, but then Paul Gephardt across the street didn't have any handlers. So one of us went over there and then, you know, Paul was racing. I did her out in active racing at the time. And he was really excited to be able to have a musher take his puppy team um, to where Dean was more on the client side of, you know, race, racing and training a team to give to somebody else to do. I did a rod. Right. So that's where Christy first got the opportunities because she was just working at a kennel that had that, had that option. Sure. Okay, and there was one you. year in the last 12 years that we had to put three teams in it. Cause my husband. Oh yeah. Okay, so that was, that was wild. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, can't, I can't imagine. Uh, I guess, I mean, the one thing is, is that when you have one team sign up, the addition of a second team is is easier than the put, putting in the first team you know what i mean like you you already like are going to be gearing up for one team so now just tack on you know extra meat it's like the the band saw is already going to be on it's already going to be running you know and the trail you know the, there's with each team it gets a little bit easier to add the next team but the total difficulty increases each time right. of course you know um yeah. <clears throat> but what is like, I don't know, like what are some of the, you have 12 Iditarods, like I'm sure they kind of blend together some of them. So I'm sure there's some very distinct moments too that you will, you know, never forget and everything in between. I mean, like what's, what's like a, maybe a highlight over the years, like a, you know, something that stands out in the, all those, um, thousand mile events y'all have been in. Yeah, even though it's like, you know, relatively either northern route or southern route, the exception of Fairbanks or the Gold Loop, it's like, wow, we've got to do all of those 
experiences that each year offers its own new challenges and memorable for a different way. I mean, your first one is always super special because it's your first Iditarod. And um, me getting to run that with Christy was great because uh, getting ready for it, I could ask her questions about everything. And it was just, it was a, definitely a huge comfort knowing that well, Christy's done this twice. So just adding me along for the ride, this is you know, not going to be scary or anything like that. So I think your first one is super memorable. How about for you? Uh, I can't not think of 2014 in the year of no snow and the most hellacious dog mushing trails I've ever been on. And that for, for one reason, one reason alone, just the trail conditions stood out in my mind. Mm -hmm. And still to this day, every time I go down the gorge, I I hit one little rock and I have a flashback. It's like PTSD of how bad it was that one year going down. And I remember getting to Roan and I was helping park teams because Anna and I got split up in there because you couldn't stop. And uh, Pete Kaiser came in and I kind of grabbed the middle of his dog team to help him park. And he says to me, has anybody died yet? And I'm like, I'm not sure. You know, I'm going through this thing too. And people are like trying to send much. We have to halt the race. This is too dangerous. And, and it was just, it was I've never been on anything like that since. And um, yeah, like Christy and I got separated going down that because at the top of the gorge, my one of my brake tines got all loose because one of the bolts fell off. So I stopped and I fixed that. Thank God it happened before I was in that crap. But so I fixed that. And then Christy is just her team was rocking and rolling and went. And then further along the way, my dogs thought, oh, this is the way to go. We went down into this brushy crap and I basically had to like turn the whole team around. I had dogs tied the trees in places. And anytime somebody came up behind me, I was helping them get past me and that kind of thing. So it took me a long time to get through the gorge. I was just drenched with sweat because it was just a horrible experience and just having to deal with a super stoked team and everything. So getting the Roan was a relief, but at the same time, leaving Roan sucked equally. Yeah, that I've done several 24-hour ultra running events and I try to think back to the worst 24 hours of my life and it usually goes back to the 24 hours it took to go from Rainy Pass to Nikolai because that was horrible physically and mentally. I mean, I was worried about the dogs. I was worried about Anna, even though she's totally capable. I mean, I'd tip and wreck my sled and felt like I, you know, broke my elbow and I couldn't, you know, straighten it out because it was effed up and yeah. stuff and just like oh my gosh it was horrible <laughs> my second I did was quite memorable because just coming down into um rainy pass I coming down some of those steeper hills I hit the brake at the exactly the wrong time and I caught this stump that was buried in the snow and everything came to a screeching halt I flew into the sled bag and my brake broke my handlebar broke um Your bridle my broke. bridle of the sled broke and just, I had to take on my axe and just hack at this stump to try to get free. And Christy tied off her team and ran back to help me. She's like, what can I do to help? I was like, if I lose them, can you please catch my team? And then she gave me a, a different snow hook to help me because I couldn't use my other ones because that's what was keeping the dogs connected to the sled. And then we spent a long time in Rainy Pass repairing my sled. And I had to drive that thing through, you know, it going to Nikolai and, that but we had a sled waiting in McGrath thankfully so I got rid of that one but that was a memorable year 2013 for that and Man. weather things crazy too just like the year we started um in Fairbanks when we did the ceremonial start they cut it short and it was 40 degrees and raining for the ceremonial start and by the time we got to Huslia it was minus 65 <laughs> so just that temperature range and that amount of days and the distance it was traveled was like you know it was crazy mm -hmm. Wow. wow. It was memorable for that. I, I, Brandon, I, I, having not known about, I, I've been hearing whispers about uh, more and more like yells, I would say, of desperation about 2014 for like years, you know. And Brandon, you know, he's been maybe less in uh, exposed to the race and stuff. And I'm uh, just thinking, what's running through your head, Brandon, all these times you hear 2014? Because it's not like 2015 was like really easy or 2022 was really easy but it's like it scares me thinking about that yeah i'm like i'm lost you know like again if for if you don't if you both of you don't know i live in atlanta georgia so um i i've been to alaska a few <laughs> times to visit sean 
And um, I have been out there for when he finished the Iditarod. So I've kind of experienced a little bit of like the winter weather, if you will, but nothing that was too crazy or anything like that. So like, I, I honestly, I, I can't imagine anything, uh, what it's like, because I've never like really been in that situation, you know, in here in Atlanta, if we get like an inch or two of snow, it completely <laughs> shuts everything down. We don't have like any snow plow. So if it actually does snow and there needs to be like roads cleared, there's not, none of that's going on. Um, and so, I mean, they've, they've gotten better recently, but um, anyways, uh, but my question was, so like I was ahead of time, I was kind of like looking at how y'all have done over the years. And I did notice that, I mean, you guys just talked about 2014, um, like normally going into the race, your goal is to get together and, and, and race together um, and, and experience it together but I guess there's been a few times where that hasn't been the case. And so I guess you are willing to like alter that game plan. If, if it calls for it, I mean, like what, I, I saw that also happen in 2018. Was that kind of like similar circumstances where it was just like, someone was kind of getting, let's see, what was it? Christy, you kind of got like the short end of the stick and Anna didn't what, what happened there? In, in 2014, that's when we had three teams in it and 18 or 2018 mm -hmm. is when we had the three teams in it. And that's when my husband, Andy, and I kind of used that as our honeymoon. So Anna had <laughs> mostly all the competitive dogs with the exception of enough leaders for Andy and I to take the the older ones and some of the the juvenile dogs um, and just travel, kind of travel the, the race course. So uh, that was one reason that year from the get go, we knew that we weren't going to travel together. And, um, that was a really special race for me too, to be able to experience that with Andy because we did meet in Ofer. And then in 2014 was the other year that we split up and, uh, where our teams were kind of, we weren't training together. We're still kind of yeah, separate Christy was running for, for Paul and I was running for Dean. So it's different, different dogs, different for Scott that year in 14. Mm. Was it Scott? Yeah, 2014, I was running with Scott Jansen that year. So just, mm -hmm. yeah, different dogs, different places we were training and that kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. yeah, just different circumstances in the race. And um, yeah, we're... I think it was fun though for Chris to be able to race it though and go. Yeah, because again, 2014 and all of its you know, horror story yeah, <laughs> and crap show was that once when I got to Shack 2, like I think I was there for almost 25 hours because there was a storm and I think there were 14 of us there waiting to leave. And when it finally let up enough, we're like, okay, let's go. And it was like somebody started this mass start and there's mushes going everywhere. And I seen some mushes going off towards the right. And I'm like, where are they going? Because I see trail markers there and there. And I asked Gary, who was there, who's lived in Shack 2 with He's like, well, that kind of goes around and ends up at the same spot, but it's a little longer. I'm like, so I can go this way. He's like, yeah. So I was like, <laughs> A little bit, then everybody caught me, and then the kind of you know everybody started to to spread back out again once that storm dissipated. But yeah, Shakti looks notorious for keeping mushrooms there longer than they've planned, I think, because of the wind. <laughs> yeah, that happened again <laughs> this year. And when someone tells you, uh, wind advisory, don't go out there. Probably gonna <laughs> listen. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then the other thing I was also looking at, I was just curious, like, is it just chance who goes across the finish line first or, you know, like I noticed Christy's Rock, kind paper, of, scissors, like it, Christy's kind of leading in that category. Like what's going on there? It's just, it's circumstantial. Like in 2022, uh, I has, was dealing with a, a virus that was being passed through my team. So I felt like I was returning dogs and my team was, was real small and in cycling, there's a, of in like the Tour de France, there's it's a team effort. Even though everybody knows the the one GC, the general category that wins it, it's a team that puts this musher through. And Anna was my domestique in that race. And the domestique takes like you know they're charging and breaking the the trail and you know carrying extra water bottles and feed for the the one general category racer that they're trying to get to the finish line. Fat you know with the best score. So she. She definitely was my domestique in that race. Anytime I had be like, can you carry my extra pair of boots for me? It's not mandatory gear. Mushers can help mushers. So she would take that stuff. So as I was just trying to 
you know, lighten my load for my seven dogs the best I could because she still, you still had 12 at that time. Mm -hmm. So it was really hard for me to to keep up. And she'd, you know, watch me run up the hill and she'd stop and wait at the top. So her barking team would motivate mine to keep charging. And then we kind of collect back together and then go again. So just, and it's a circumstance who ends up, I think, yeah, being we, in the we lead. don't really have a conversation about it ever. It's just kind of as we're, you know, going through safety, we both know what we went through in that 900 miles to 950 miles of who should cross the finish line first. And that's just, but it doesn't matter besides what's written in the books. It doesn't matter. Okay. But to us, it's like, we, we know we went, we went through and it's like, maybe it's like, yeah, Christy, you know, she, she led the way, way across the sea ice where it was super nasty and that kind of thing. Or my team was maybe slower. So they were feeding off of Christy, you know, breaking the wind and chasing them and that kind of stuff. So uh, I almost like maybe looking back to think that my team maybe in the front part of the race is faster, but I don't know. It seems like Christy's team is faster towards the end and I just benefit from following that you. I don't know what it is, but yeah, we just don't really talk about it. We both know. And about- then sometimes so our trackers are like right on top of each other, pinging within seconds of each other. And just because it says that I got to the checkpoint first because of the tracker doesn't necessarily mean I did. And a lot of times we go to sign in, and they'll write the wrong name down. I'm like, oh, right, I'm, you know, I'm going to sign for Anna, even though as they wrote it wrong, and I could care less. Yeah, uh huh. <laughs> just yeah. Hmm. Nice. Yeah, I could mean, picture you uh, being like, hey, do you mind carrying a couple extra things since I have a seven dog team? <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely, no problem. You like pull out a cinder block. You're like, is this cool? Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, here's a boat anchor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we got like three coolers of food. They're only like forty pounds each. Thanks, sis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Box, um. <laughs> nice so yeah you talk about bike cycling um y'all are uh do other athletic endeavor uh, you're you're am- among the list of mushers that are athletes in your own right uh and so yeah talk about uh you know running your marathons and i don't i don't know at what you know what i don't know much about y'all's you know athletic history i see that you run these races both for cycling and for running Uh, my brother does uh like sprint triathlons i'm sure he's going to be excited to hear about uh what y'all have to say but you know you've got a few marathons under your belt and uh, you said an ultra 24 hour races or something yeah, we both dogs. The dogs are just the ultimate inspiration because they're the the ultimate athlete. I mean, they're their their recovery times and their speed and their attitude and everything and their just desire to to love to do it. And um, that's really motivating, inspiring. So we definitely translate that into um, summertime. And then when you're going through all winter, you know, keeping tedious track of every dog's mileage and their training plan and then you know after I, um, I did a rod and it's kind of over and it's, you're not keeping track of this plan you kind of feel a little lost so it's nice to kind of pick up um, and you know plan for your own running races and training and stuff like that so Anna does a lot of the triathlons because uh, for some reason she's an incredible swimmer and I am not <laughs> she's got the mechanics down just right and it's really frustrating when we you know mass start like you know, in a triathlon and she takes off and all I see is this wake of feet. And I'm just like, I don't, which direction I even go. And she's out and got her wetsuit off and, you know, jumping on her bike. And I'm just like, wait. Yeah. But you <laughs> in the bike and the yeah, run. Yeah. She, she was like, such a good swimmer. And, and seeing somebody that's your carbon copy having like breeze through it while you're just struggling. It's just really frustrating. I'm like, why do I suck at this so bad? <laughs> so I kind of gave up triathlons for that reason because it was so incredibly frustrating to to try to keep up with her. And I felt like I was holding her back. Like you're one triathlon we did, she was waiting for me, like, oh good job, you're getting out of the water. And I'm just kind of like, <laughs> I was like a drowned rat. And she was like all happy and perky, like, let's go to the bike. And I'm just like, okay. <laughs> you know, effort for the bike and the run and we do a lot more cycling. I mean, that's probably my weakest of the three things. And then I think last year was the first year I raced an ultra with Chrissy. Otherwise, Chrissy's done and won a couple of those 24-hour races where you see who can run the furthest in 24 hours. So there's like typically a, a four and a, about a quarter mile course that you go around and around and around and around as many times as you can in 24 hours. And she's won that race a couple of times. And with what's cool with ultra running, it's just like mushing, it doesn't matter if you're male or female or whatever you want to identify as. It's the 
for whoever ran the farthest, the fastest. So it's like mushing. Whoever got to know him first, do one Iditarod. Doesn't matter what you are. So that's really cool that ultra running is a lot in that same judged category. And um, I ran a 50K with her last year. And then, um, yeah, you've done that 50K quite a few times, though. Yeah. And then and marathon running is fun and half marathons. And the furthest triathlon we've done is a half Ironman up in uh, near Fairbanks. Man, yeah. Dang. All right, all right. Hold on, I gotta, yeah. I gotta get in here for a second. So, uh, first thing that strikes me is, uh, talk to me about the ultras here. So, like, you're winning these races. How many miles are you accomplishing in 24 hours? I've only done two of the 24 hour races, and I, I won both of them. And each time, I got just shy of 90 miles. And they're, they're trail races. It's not all flat. So um, they're up here in Alaska on the, you know, single track trails and um, it's just keep, keep going. <laughs> yeah. Where are they? Uh, one of them I did was at Kepler Bradley and then the, the other one, State Park, State Park. And then the other one was the Beach Lake, oh, Beach Lake and Chugiak. Okay. Huh. There's that one was kind of fun because they gave you four tokens and there's a hill in there because they call heartbreak hill. And there was a little can at the bottom. That said, you can pass this hill four times and not do it if you want to, but you have to deposit a token. But for every token you save, you get entered in for a prize. So I was like, I want the prize. I'm not spending any of my tokens that go up and over that hill. And there was no prize at the end, but I felt like I, I honestly earned that win for doing the hill every single time. But that one was much more hilly than the the first one that I, I did but a lot of times I would think back about I think of how the dogs would do and then also it was funny you know when I get to White Mountain I was like come on guys it's only 77 miles to finish I run over 77 <laughs> miles and the dogs had to look at me like yeah but <laughs> somebody 900. 900 miles before so yeah so so are you literally running the entire 24 hours or do you like take are you walking for some of that or do you have yeah. a moment where you sit down and like enjoy a, a snack for two and a half minutes or something? Yeah. Everybody does it kind of different and it's not, you know, you know, was, I had never done it before. I didn't know. And so you get, everybody takes off all together. And I think it started at noon. So at noon to noon, and then we're all kind of jogging along, you know, no one's like, you know, running real fast. And we get the first hill and everybody started walking. I'm like, oh, okay. We walk up all the hills. Interesting. That makes sense. We're saving our energy. So I was learning as I was going along. And then um, the mistake I think I made in that race is like, it felt really good just to go really fast down the hill and just open up your stride and stuff. So I think I kind of burned up my legs running really fast down the hills. So I, I kind of learned like, okay, next time we do one of these, don't do that. Because some people were even walking down the hills too. So, But um, you ran the first yeah, 60 miles. I ran the first 60 miles. And then after that, it was just kind of like, I run the flat parts and then any sort of hill I was walking. And then my speed actually got slower and slower. And then towards the end, I was just walking every lap. And then there's like a feed station at the start and the end where you can, you know, you can put your own food there. If you want to roll out a sleeping bag and take a nap, there's a, like a, there was a warming fire and a, you know, outhouse and stuff. So how much time you want to spend at the checkpoint is up to you. And it was a lot of fun trying to be like watching how long it was taking other people and trying to get out of that checkpoint, which is kind of like mushing before the other person saw. So they didn't see how crappy you looked leaving or how <laughs> great you looked leaving. And sometimes I'd leave the checkpoint running. And then as soon as I got around the corner, I was walking and limping, you know, because I, like, <laughs> I wanted to make it look like I had a lot in the tank, but it was, I did a race last year. It was a backyard ultra and that one is last man standing. So that one can go for days. Whoever, is it starts the race starts on the hour every hour and you do that same four miles and you have to tow the line ready set go and then you have an hour to make it and then however fast you do it that's your break time before you start the race again so if you fail the total line you're out if you don't make it to the finish line for that hour of the race you're also out so that one i didn't like as much because there wasn't as much you know, mystery on what was going on. You all took off together. There was no faking it that you felt really good because <laughs> you're all taking off together. So, hmm. but that was, and I didn't make it as far as I'd hoped because I was working through an injury and it was pouring rain and 40 some degrees. It was not the greatest uh, well, race yeah, day. And then but... you missed one of the turns and ended up yeah. going too far and didn't make the cutoff for yeah, the flower. So, so I got eliminated that way, but it was really fun. It was a, just a, you know, a good group of people that all kind of have the like mind of, 
let's run until we can. <laughs> is is it is the training as simple as you just you ran to train or like I mean you know uh obviously you know in a triathlon I I, I do all the things leading up to the event right uh but it's never like the full amount so it's not like you're gonna go do 24 hours to re- practice uh like how do you do you just kind of wing that or like w- how does that work yeah i did and I, i'm lucky that my job is really physical i do landscaping so I w- i'm on my feet all day so i thought that helped a lot you know up to 12 hours a day and like the you know the fitbit watch will say we did like what how many steps Oh, say so you did the 30, 40,000 steps just at work. Yeah. Holy so it's just shit. like, I, I thought I was training at work. And then I tried to, I'd have a, like, I'd run four days a week and I'd have a, a fun run, like a tempo run. I'd have a double run where I ran once in the morning and once at night, a long LSD run where it's, it's okay, I'm going to go for the longest distance I ever have. And then maybe like a, a short sprint run. And that was it, you know, because I was trying to get, a lot of it, I think, is mental. I mean, you have to be, you know, in decent enough shape too. But at the same time, if you're keep yourself healthy, that you haven't been injured, and um, you're mentally ready for the sleep deprivation part, and you pace yourself and take care of yourself during the race, and obviously include some running in there, that you'll, you know, I think you'll do good and work and kind of race your way into shape. You know, I started with doing a a 10k at racing, and then I did a half marathon and kind of do those other distances you know it's kind of like with the mushing you know you do the twos and threes during the you know uh season prior to i did a rod just to get into to race shape and stuff so yeah you know, cross trained with cycling and yeah uh yeah just be, being active for that long i think helps did i hear you refer to a run as lsd <laughs> long slow distance yeah long slow distance okay hmm. all right <laughs> thank you thank you i hadn't right. heard that one either brennan yeah, i was like I, i'll I, just I, pretend I, like i know what that I, is no let me fill the <laughs> gaps here please i need to know <laughs> um so okay well that that's that, that's super interesting and then i guess like the half half iron man is pro is like is there a desire to get the iron man or was the half iron man kind of like all right that's that's good no, I, I would like to do a full Ironman. The half iron was fun. Um, uh, I feel very kind of new also in doing triathlons. I'm still learning a lot of stuff. It's, you know, like like you do, you learn about how to do the swim and then, you know, being bike savvy and doing a lot of time on the bike. And then the running seems like the easiest part just because, okay, just go run at the same time. But I still feel like I have a lot to learn about it. And I think that I might, someday just go and do an Ironman distance wise on my own, even if it's not an official Ironman, you know, racing with everybody and doing it. Those races are kind of hard to get into. And And up here in Alaska, there's like two. (laughs) Yeah. They, yeah. They had the one in June and then the Alaska man one. So it might have to travel if you want to do a certified real one, but um, someday it'd be nice too, but we'll see. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, my experience with running has been like I run just enough to like almost get in good running shape. And then I run the race and it's really hard. And then I'm just basically the whole time I'm just never in good enough shape for it to be like fun yet. I'm like, where does the fun start? You know? <laughs> but I would imagine like if I was in like amazing physical condition, I could just like it's pretty crazy to people can just run like 10 miles in like you know a little an hour or an hour a little longer and you know that's like i mean that's like a registered vehicle right there you know that's like that's a that's that's fast you know i've never been i've never been that fast for that long so that's i can imagine if i could just break through that wall or maybe it's like the fourth wall or the fifth wall (laughs) i might find a way to enjoy it but i'm like a lab you know i need to chase a ball or something you know yeah, yeah, I feel different with that. I feel like I enjoy the endorphins. I'm not an adrenaline junkie at all. I don't like heights and jumping from them and going <laughs> fast. I don't like that stuff. So I definitely am addicted to endorphins. <laughs> yeah, and I feel like I kind of, I'm the type of athlete that I tend to race I did Iditarod as. I'm not the top 10 podium person. I'm doing it because I enjoy it and I love it and whatever the outcome happens, but I'm not, it makes you feel good. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not fast. I'm not the best, but I love it. Yeah. Then, so bringing it back to, uh, I believe 
it's a mushing podcast, so I guess we should talk about that a little more. But uh, but uh, like you know, you guys are not. I'm, I'm sure. I think there's been some years where you've you've uh, you've definitely cracked cracked uh, cracked the top twenty, and um, but generally, you know, there's probably been some years your goals were to get maybe have that breakthrough year. Uh, but generally, you know, you guys correct me if I'm wrong. You're go out there to just enjoy the trail, finish the the best that you can finish with the team that you got in front of you. You know, whether that means towards the back, or the middle, or the back of the front of the pack, or whatever. Is that kind of your intentions when you go into these events? Yeah, I think getting in the top twenty is, you know, that's a good goal for us. Other people like you know. Uh, oh no, being top five, that's my goal. Well, for us getting in the top 20 is a achievable goal, but it's not easy. And then um, we always have that. I'm sorry no, to interrupt ahead. you. Always have that uh, having to field two teams. Because I think if we were to try to stack one, there would definitely be a better dog Yeah, because we spread our talent out in the dog lot between two teams. So if we just put them all on one team, I think that you know achieving the top 20 would be easier easier more you know achievable um and then and i just can, what's that go ahead, go ahead i was just gonna say you know christy could just be hiding like in a tent in ofer somewhere <laughs> and then just like plop onto the sled real yeah, like, wow, so fresh after 500 miles <laughs> yeah <laughs> no we're, we're microchip just like the dogs are we tried that <laughs> oh, damn. are you really <laughs> okay i was like <laughs> That's pretty. That's a pretty good idea. They might have. That might not be a bad. You know, a little like amendment to the rules. Like if you are identical twins, sorry, yeah. but we're gonna have to <laughs> chip you. <laughs> yeah, and I don't think I'm not a risk taker with the mushing. I'm not gonna. I'm. You know, you're gonna go in there with the plan and pretty much stick to it. I'm not gonna like. Yeah, I'm gonna see what happens and try this. I'm not a risk taker like that. No, so pretty conservative. Pretty conservative, and that kind of thing with it comes, with, and that that's okay. I, I can. I can go to bed at night or I can finish. I did run getting to know him a bit. I'm, I'm happy with what happened. What it went well, I got happy dogs and I'm good. So, yeah, you know, I think um, a lot of times this, you know, because of a lack of resources of being able to follow the entire race, you're not, you, sometimes you don't get as good of information of what's going on in the middle and back of the pack. Um, but, you know, I've worked for the people that are, you know, Dallas and Jeff, they're trying to, they were, when I was working at Jeff's, he's trying to, you know, win, uh, of course, Dallas is too. And, you know, so they have this hope, uh, among other hopes and on the long list of, of goals for the season, but you know, I, I they're going to probably come away with that check, whatever it is. That's that 30 plus grand or whatever, if you finish fifth or whatever. And y'all are pretty like, you know, if you if don't finish in the top 20, you're taking home your thousand bucks to fly the yourselves and the dogs home, maybe, you know? So yeah, you know, financially planning for that. I can, I like looked at y'all's website. You guys seem like you just, uh, you, you got a good, nice list of sponsors that, are, you know, and every little amount amount happens. Uh, and you're probably one of the biggest, the, uh, you know, stories in each I did or odd people are always paying attention to you know the Barrington twins and it's not because you're gonna finish top five it's because it's cool you guys are like twins you're going down the trail it's a like a cool story um but you know what's like how, how is it you know it's already a, such a money hole such a terrible <laughs> financial investment what you guys are doing I don't know why you're doing it uh yeah. no <laughs> but what is you know what is it like planning you know like how how are you guys you guys busting your butt every summer i guess just saving up as much money as you can landscaping or fishing or constructing houses or whatever it is you've done over the years and then seeing if you can get you know gci sponsors you i think and they're a big local company you know how how do y'all you know make it happen every year it's amazing oh uh, yeah it's definitely i mean you know, redlining it at the end of the season, like, okay, we need to start work like now because, but I mean, at the same time that you never like get into it so bad that you can't, you know, take care of your dogs and your family and all that kind of stuff. But it's, we pull it off. <laughs> yeah. We definitely, you know, because of the sponsors we're able to, to do it the way we do it. Um, 
So that's, yeah, they're, they're very important to. Yeah. To what and we do. yeah, then it's great. Like the sponsors are happy to see that, you know, it's the love of the dogs and the sport that keeps us in it. It's not because we're, you know, trying to win it and that kind of thing. So it's just a different, like you said, story and this thing that they admire and appreciate with what we do. So if we didn't have those sponsors, we couldn't, we couldn't pull it off like that. Two teams, you know, I mean, our whole lives, our family and everything, it's like, it's two of everything. <laughs> so it's just like, it's keep going with that as long as we can make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, it's, it really is a miracle. I say, it, I've said it too many times on the podcast, but just to get to the start line is mm-hmm. in some ways a bigger accomplishment than the finish line. <laughs> what, uh, uh what uh like what does the future look like with the Iditarod? You guys are on a crazy run of 14 and 12 in a row. Like, I mean, at some point, you know, is there a year you want to take off or are you gonna kind of keep trucking there? What do you what's uh what's your thoughts on that? Uh we've been asked that a lot, and obviously, you know, the signups and are coming up in June, so um it's not in the back of our mind, but, uh, I'm not, I don't know what we'll do. We haven't quite 100% decided. Yeah. And to figure it out that oh, so many people like you guys should put one team in it, you don't go for it and put one team in it. And that would be fun to see it, how, if we try to be competitive, how we would stack up. Um, and that's like, well, who gets to drive the team, you know, kind of thing between the two of us. And, um, I think that if we do have to do that, it'll figure out and be a fun, thing and it's it's a lot of dogs to keep in training we have two teams and you know with money being difficult and stuff it might financially come down to we can only afford doing the one team so i mean yeah in the near future if not this year maybe a different year we might only have one team from seeing double sled dog racing so we'll see how it goes in the in years past we've talked about like oh one of us can go do the quest and the other us can do i did or i kind of what ali and alan did but then both mm-hmm. of us can race you know and try to do well and the dogs are going to get incredible training. And um, so we've definitely talked about that being a possibility too, or, you know, neither one of us has done the 440. So the dog team would be in incredible shape after I did a rod to go up and, and do that afterwards. So we're definitely exploring our options at this point. And then we grew up in Northern Wisconsin and we followed the bear grease every year. So there's also an attraction to possibly go down and do a couple of races in that circuit. So we're, you know, neither um, confirming or denying the fact that there will or will not be two. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> okay, good. good answer. Good answer. Great. Yeah. yeah. Have y'all done the Bear Grease? We've never done that. Uh-uh. Yeah. Yeah. Wade was just like bragging about the whole circuit down there and was saying how like, there's crazy. There's just like thousands of fans like at the checkpoints watching you do your dog chores. And it's just a whole nother, you know, there's just every there's everybody so close so they can it's everything so accessible and easy to see and that sounds like a really fun thing and he was he was really selling like (laughs) wisconsin or whatever i was like damn he's like dude it's 40 percent of the money that i used to spend in alaska or whatever and he just told us (laughs) okay he saw y'all yeah uh, I don't see why you guys left Wisconsin, the mush dogs in Alaska. Like everything's so much more affordable down here. <laughs> like a bowl of straw isn't like twenty dollars; it's like five, <laughs> and that kind of thing. It's like a meat and kibble is so easy to get. It's like you know. And I was like, well, why did you leave Alaska? <laughs> you know, it's like the dinner rods up there and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, it was funny to hear him say that because he lives in Solon Springs now, and that's maybe like thirty something miles from where we grew up. So, oh, wow. It's cool though that he's mushing down there, and Ryan too. You know he's down there mm, mushing. I forgot about that. He's yeah, about twenty miles from. Yeah, uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> like Ryan will send us a picture. It's like, oh, you recognize this? And there's a sign that says Iron River, eighteen miles that way. It's like, yeah, that's uh, Iron River is only fifteen miles or eighteen miles from where we grew up and stuff. So he's on oh, the trails no. that that you know we know of in that. So that, that's cool. Well, but there is so- a fan base down there of mushing. People love it. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I always, you know, cause Alaska's here and I'm here. And so I just pay attention to stuff up here, but you know, you hear these whispers of what's going on down there. And I've gotten to, I, I was in Oregon for one winter with some dog with uh, Rachel Sidoris's dogs. And, uh, and then, you know, th- I heard about this Idaho sled dog challenge that one of the people ran and it was like, sounded pretty crazy, like super hilly. And I don't know. Um, so yeah, I, I, I've, I've now, I'm now 
now that I'm hearing about these races, I'm like, I need to, I need to yeah. maybe do a little <laughs> more research here on, on how cool these things must be. Um, and yeah, you know, maybe I'm, I'm almost positive that Nike and Adidas are listening to the podcast and, the, <laughs> and since they're listening, they'll probably give you that sponsorship you need so that you can both run the race next year. Uh, yeah. so, you know, fingers crossed, uh, on that, uh, well, maybe sounds, under armor. It sounds like, uh, there's intentions to continue to mush, whether it's Iditarod or other races. It doesn't sound like you guys are, are getting close to like maybe moving on to another phase of life. You still sound pretty embedded into the mushing scene. Yeah, that's hundred percent true. If there was no Iditarod or we couldn't afford to do it, we'd still have dogs and still be out there running them and having fun yeah. doing that. So definitely keep running dogs and, Hopefully I did Rod still in the cards, but um, yeah, we'll definitely still have dogs. And yeah. And the thing I love about I did a Rod is the support you get to go on this adventure with your dog team. How, how else do you do a thousand mile journey with your dogs without that kind of support? I mean, it's incredible. And to go places where you can't go, I mean, there's are no roads to know. So it's really cool to be able to, to do that. And um, you'd have to figure out your own, uh, you know, sag wagon of somebody to help you, you know, to do an adventure like that. So just, I just, we both love doing it together and with the dogs and just exploring Alaska. It's just, you know, it's an, it's an incredible experience. And to uh, I can't imagine my life without it in some fashion. Yeah. And so, uh, sorry, Sean. So there just, I got to ask, like, uh, there's not like a burnout necessarily you know like it sounds like you have to work heavily in the summer after the did rod and get a lot of work in make your money and then you get the training and you know like sean ha has talked about you know like his doing it before and like he he's talked about how you know it it's tough it gets it wears on you after a while um but you know I mean, y'all are like a decade and a half running here. So it's just, for me, it's, I, I'm just like, it's super impressive. You know, I'm chiming in on this before the ladies get in on this, because firstly, all right, I'm, I can be tough too. All right. I could do, I could do it for 14 years, Brennan. All right. But I just, you know, <laughs> no, I, you know, I think it's, it's gotta be pretty special for the girls to, be doing their kennel their way you know their dogs their training you know that that i think that that for my my opinion is gonna help to that longevity and that motivation it's like this is your like you're designing and creating here you know whereas i i was i mean the reality there's just a difference between having your own kennel and not and and i you know i was just kind of like a soldier doing his duty you know but because i didn't know any better a and b is jeff's dogs or is dallas's dogs or whatever so you know you do feel kind of i feel like i was and then of course i'm from atlanta and i'm super soft and i grew up playing tennis but that's not important oh okay wow. um <laughs> but isn't is that that's got to be a big like i don't know when i get home at the end of the day i'm like more excited to get to work on my stuff than i am to you know, you just find like an extra gear because it's your project. It's your thing that yeah, you're doing for you. Uh, yeah, that's an accurate statement because if if you're working with someone else's dogs and at any time you'd be like, you know what? Not for me. I'm I'm out. But when you commit to owning 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 dogs, you can't just say I'm done. You have to you you I mean you can't just put the snowmobile in the barn and forget about it. You have an obligation to care and take care of these animals and stuff. So there is a huge commitment and just altering lifestyle when you do decide to have your own kennel. And when we were in your position, the soldier aspect part, mm -hmm. all the time I was thinking in the back of my mind, like, yes, sir, I'll do it that way. But I was like, well, when I have my own kennel, you know, <laughs> you know. Yeah. so I would file that back in my mind. Like, I'm not going to do it this way, but do it. I mean, you have to be respectful that they work to get their kennel the way they like it the way they want it the experiences made them choose the way that they do it and you gotta you know you gotta do it that way and i would both of us were like filing things back like this is the way i would like to do it when we have our own dogs so to do it the way you want to with your own dogs 
um, in your own way and stuff is very rewarding. And we don't have any handlers. My husband is as closest thing to a handler as we, we have, but um, it's really rewarding to do all those things, all the training miles that the dogs had on them, we put on them and all the meat that was cut, we cut and all the chores that were done, we did. So um, it's just, it's rewarding that way. And uh, yeah, that's the tries and the fails. It's like, oh, wait, we're going to start this year with this type of training plan. Hopefully it works out good. And maybe at the end of the season, like, wow, that was way too many miles we put on the dogs. They peaked before I did a rod and they were already dropping off and we lost speed and it didn't go well. Next year, we're not doing that. So you don't have anybody to blame but yourself for putting up that plan and trying it. So you go back to the drawing board and you start over and that can just a huge responsibility in that regard instead of just be like, oh, what, what are we doing today? Oh, we're running a 50. Cool. And then you go out and do it. And handlers are awesome. They do relieve a lot of pressure and things that other stuff because you know there's endless to-do list of stuff to do at a kennel so having help is amazing but i mean it all comes down when you own the dog and you're making all the financial decisions and the breedings and the litters and the training and all that kind of stuff is it's a lot yeah yeah i know i every time i think about getting some dogs just even just a six dog team or something then i start to think about all the things and i'm like well the idea sounds nice, but yeah, you know, it is, it is a lot and uh, not just financially, just on every other level. So talking about non Iditarod things like the Yukon Quest, have y'all ran that one? Chris, I ran once. it in 2010 when the full thousand, 12, 12 yeah, 2012, uh, she ran it. 2012. That year, yeah. And y'all have run, you guys, y'all have mostly, you've done, you do like the Connect. 200 sometimes maybe or the goose bay tuck buck whatever one fit the, i can't ever i always crack up with the name it's the tug the goose the tug bar goose bay 150 right is that what it is that covers tug. all of it yeah all right i just every time i say that uh i always like purposefully mess it up because it's four words so i'm just like the duck buck two buck one you know anyways uh, so y'all, every season it's kind of I did or I is the goal, and if a race happens to fall into the training well enough, you'll race it. Or is it you know? And early on, you obviously had your qualifiers, and you know, um, but yeah, you know, you're out with the dogs on the probably training on the Denali Highway sometimes, and if the if it's good down in y'all's neck of the woods, you're training there. But what is some of the Highlights of maybe off the Iditarod Trail uh, over the years. I had, uh, yeah, we've both done the Copper Basin and Christy. I haven't done the Cusco. Christy's done that one a couple times. Mm-hmm. And we've done the Connect 200 when they had the Testamina 200. We did that one, the Will 300, and races that have gone away that we did the Northern Lights 300, the Tiaga 300, the, the Sea Mountain 150, the Klondike. On our just like, I was like, oh, back in the day, we used to do this race and now they're not around anymore, which is a bummer. But we've been really lucky to be able to do a lot of different mid-distance races, not too much racing up and around Fairbanks. So maybe that would be a fun thing to do. But um, we've gone both ways where it's like, okay, we're going to do these races, these twos and three hundreds to get ready for I did rod and get the pups in it and that kind of thing. And then other years we're like, well, maybe we won't do so many of the mid-distance races because you have to run them in a certain format. It's not really fitting into what we want to do. So I think that's kind of was the old school pro, school approach. You know, the first race was the Aurora 50-50 and then you did that one. Then the next race was a Knick and it was just a gradual progression for training. So it made sense to do the Aurora, the Can, the Sheep Mountain 150, the Knick, the Copper Basin, maybe the Cusco if your team is good enough to do both of those, maybe do the Tustamina 200 and then, you know, you're getting close to Iditarod time or Quest time. And I think that was how, you know, it, you raced your way into shape Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I miss the Tustamina 200. That was such a fun race. Yeah. For, versus now I think people are like, I can do my own race simulations and, you know, maybe not spend that money on that $500 entry fee. So right. I think just uh, the whole training aspects change so much that, you know, people don't feel obligated to to race to give their dogs those experiences. Mm-hmm. There's definitely been a philosophical difference among mushers, you know, there where you see and they're and they're both right, you know. It's ultimately because Pete Kaiser's this perennial Cusco 300 champion also goes on and wins that Ditterod, and you know 
Uh, and then you have Dallas, who pretty much never does mid distance races. And of course, he wins I did her. There is. And then wins I did her on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's like, what has he been up to this winter? And he's like, oh, there, <laughs> there he is. Uh, uh-huh. Yeah. You know, Ben, the reason is, is when you run a 300 mile race, you're not running at a thousand mile pace because you're not planning on running a thousand miles, right? You only got 300. So you can kind of empty the tank sooner, uh, so to speak. <laughs> right. And you get all this. Yeah. A lot of those races have a lot of mandatory rest. So you kind of have to do these like long runs and long rests, or at least you're doing these long rests. And so it's, it's just a totally different thing, but it still is good to simulate, you know, being around other dog teams, maybe exposing them to other dogs, you know, germs and stuff and seeing new trails and helping with the race excitement. And there's obviously things that'll translate over to Iditarod. Um, but well, yeah, uh, Christy, what was what was it like the year that you did the I did rod and quest? That's that's uh, a lot of miles there. I was really thankful to have Anna, um, even though she was preparing for her first I did a rod. She was also doing my I did a rod food drops at that same time. So I was very fortunate to have somebody that's like minded as me that know and knows me that when she packed my bags for me because they were due almost like when I was gone, that, you know, everything was as I wanted it. So I was very fortunate to have that, but, um, they did or it felt easier to me after doing the quest. So it was always like, Oh, rest up and then, you know, go do another thousand mile race. Um, but it was, I was just really fortunate to be able to, to do both races. And I've, I've constantly had a desire to go back and do the quest, but at the same time, it's, it's a daunting race and it's a, a totally different kind of preparation to, uh, to do that race. So it t- definitely takes a team, um, for to compete in that race because you need somebody to drive and you know pick return dogs get gear and then you got to drive all the way back and and stuff versus i did or i just like you're out on your own and you know get to the finish line you fly home (laughs) yeah yeah go ahead brennan well so so anna you you handled for christy in that race i assume oh no not for all of it i just i flew to whitehorse and then got picked up and got to see her in brayburn um, because I was working on the food drops and training your and own. training oh. my team and that kind oh. of thing. I would have loved to. That would have been great, but I didn't get to. But she was. I also didn't tell her. She thought I'll see you at the finish line. Yeah. But I got a ride to Brayburn and I got to see her in Brayburn. She was doing your jog tours and everything like that. And then she stood up and looked up and she was like, "Oh my gosh!" She like ran over to me and yeah, my big hug and that kind of thing and that stuff. So that was fun to see her there. But yeah, it would be a lot of fun to be her handler on the quest or something like that, to see her at every checkpoint and that kind of thing. That'd be a lot of fun. Yeah, or like the Bear Grease where you can have a handler do everything for you. There's nobody I would trust more with my dogs. And as far as the dogs know, maybe it is me. <laughs> so yeah. They're doing everything for them because they they have a hard time telling our voices apart. I think they can tell definitely know there's two of us, but the voice thing is really throws them all off. <laughs> That yeah, is we, funny. I we, wonder I wonder about that. Go ahead, Brennan. We talked about at the beginning of this before we started recording about trying to figure out a, a method of identifying who's speaking or not. And we we never really came up oh, with yeah. a good one. No. Um, but if you are watching on YouTube, Christy's in purple and Anna is in red. She's wearing a hat. So <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> hopefully you've been able to follow along and there hey, people little... are saying that we, Brandon and I, also have a similar voice. We don't have the appearance thing, but uh, we do sound somewhere on the phone. And now I have heard myself and I've heard Brandon on the phone. And I'm, I actually think they're onto something. We do kind of have the same sound going on. A good test if you want to know if your voices are similar. Like, I can open Anna's phone with my face. And I can also, if I say hey theory she both phones would be like yes you know how can i help you so, Ooh, that's a good idea yeah. Yeah. right wow. they do sound very similar and i could see the resemblances that your brothers but yeah your voice does sound a lot alike <laughs> yeah no uh i'm i'm the i'm the bald brother with you know the who's a little bit heavier as well sean's got like the, the beautiful hair that's not falling out and <laughs> is not as heavy uh, speaking of which, ladies, can we get an opinion on the fresh cut that he's got? He's lost the the Iditarod locks, if you will. Yeah, when we saw him at a friend's party, there, I was like, oh, you got your hair done. It looks nice. It yeah. must feel good for summer to not have the Iditarod. And for fishing. Yeah. Uh-huh. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does. It does feel pretty good to have the hair cut. Although I, I think I might get it cut one more time just so I can get it really short at first, just to feel that. And then I'm, I think I'm going to grow it back out. I just, I don't know. I feel, oh, it feels weird. It doesn't feel yeah. right. Dude, I like the little, you got that like little curl going on right here. At the top <laughs> it looks, it looks kind of sexy to you, little guy. Yeah. You. <laughs> oh, Just gosh. Curl. <laughs> curl. Hey, I we know. Got, we got to make the folks laugh. All right. Oh, you know? Yeah. yeah, I guess. Yeah. The, uh, I, before I grew it out, it was actually just kind of wavy. And now I feel like I grew it out. It kind of got to be its true self. And now it's all, it's curly. It's not even that long. Um, but yeah, I'm thinking buzz cut here next week. Get the get the beard off. Going full then, full naked, huh? And then disappear <laughs> onto a boat for two Arrow. months. Yeah. Um, so cool. Uh Brennan, you have do you have a timer going? Yeah, we're we're getting close to that hour mark. Um, so definitely want to respect y'all's time. Um, it's been fun. Sean and I, I'm sure we could uh we could we could ask a lot more questions and talk, talk our heads off a lot longer. So um, just want to be respectful of, of, you know, uh, the question I have, sorry to cut you off. I, uh, was wondering who are some of the all time great, uh, dogs that have been on your team? Uh, Rizzo is one of mine. She was a dog that we raised one of the first litters that we had. And she's, hardly 50 pounds and uh, she's a little bit timid around people she doesn't know and that kind of thing but she's just she's just a brilliant leader and that kind of thing and she just has taught so many other dogs how to be a good leader so she's just kind of set the bar she was just wonderful to have and this was the first year in probably like five years where she wasn't on my team so to, to have to take confidence in my other leaders, like, oh my God, Rizzo's not on my team. I need, I need her. We got, she's the one who gets through the, through the bad ice and all that stuff that, I mean, it was. It's both teams. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Uh-huh. Eventually I had to bite the bullet and know that she wasn't going to be there one of these days. And she's nine years old now. So it's just, you know, um, she still has a job at the kennel and that kind of stuff. But yeah, Rizzo definitely sticks out. And I mean, you look at her and she's she's a cute little dog and you know, little, but I mean, you wouldn't think that she is the amazing lead dog that she is. So Rizzo is definitely one of those all time dogs for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Then I'd have to say two of our oldest dogs in the kennel, uh, Jonah, who was our first sled dog. He taught us a lot and was there for a lot of our first. He was on my first Iditarod. He did Anna's my qualifiers. My qualifies flyers with her um we trained him as a puppy he was our first sled dog that we owned that Anna won in a bet <laughs> and uh he'll be 15 on June 6th yeah we won our first wow. race together and uh he ran the quest and I did a ride with me and just he did a, he was there for a lot of firsts and he's just been a really good dog and taught, taught a lot of the other dogs lots of good stuff and it was just such an easy dog to work with very smart um fast enough always ate excellent coat and just just a really phenomenal dog yeah Yeah. Uh so he's he's he is a really special dog and then another dog that i've had um he's retired now too but his name is duramax and i've never had a dog that's worked harder than that and he's just and super smart and but he just he loved to work he loved to have a job he wasn't the kind of dog that was going to jump up on you and lick your face he was like i want to go to work and i will work at a hundred and you know, 90% all the time and no matter what. And he's, he got me through some, you know, really tough spots. And I really respect him for that. Cause he's just, he's a, he is an amazing dog, but uh, at the same time, he's, he's very, very old now. <laughs> Hard it's to crazy. see. Him. Yeah. Some, Worst dog. part about dogs is that they don't live 89 years. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> You know, so that has me, uh, I'm just kind of like thinking over here, um, you know, you've trained and and had a lot of dogs in your years of doing the Iditarod and mushing. Um, does it get easier on the like losing a dog thing? Like, is it just like something that is in part of the the sport? Is it like, I mean, I don't know. I'm a softie, right? Like I have my first dog I've ever had Finn. It's an Italian greyhound. It's a crazy little small dog. (laughs) 
it, we never were thinking about getting this dog, but we had an opportunity to save him and we did. Um, he's probably pushing like 11 or 12. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like I know he's not going to be around forever. And the thought of losing him is just like devastating to me. And like, having that happen over the years consistently, I would be like, would I become numb to that? Or would it just always be really tough? You know? I think it's always really tough. And we're starting to experience that most now because, you know, we started off at Dean's and we work with Paul and we work with Scott. And then now that they're our dogs and that kind of thing, not that you weren't as bonded with the other ones, but you know, we bounced around the kennel. So you weren't at that life stage as much for those older dogs and that. So then now we are, and it's, it's hard. Yeah, I think everybody mourns a little different way when you do lose a dog. Um, some people, you know, rush right in and get another dog because they, you know, they're not looking to replace that one, but they're re- looking to replace the feeling that, or, you know, continue the feelings that that companion was giving them. And um, we're just fortunate to have, you know, more love from more dogs to be able to, I don't want to say get over it any easier, but just, like I said, just cope and, and mourn different. Yeah. And it's, and it, it slowly wears on you too. It's like, you know, you're racing, you're training, you're raising these pups. And then, you know, then that key dog retires. That's like the first step. And oh man, you are aging. And then you see him slow down that kind of thing. You're like, oh, yep. You showing your age now and that kind of stuff. It doesn't make it easier, but it's just, you know, that progression is, is very noticeable. But like Chrissy said, it's because you have so many dogs to love that they, they need you. So you can't just you know, shrivel up in a ball and say, you know, I'm done because I lost this dog, but it's, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. You do experience it a lot more than typical than most people. Right. Yeah. I just, uh, hearing you guys, hearing you both talk about the dogs just got me thinking about that. I'm like, oh man, you know, that can't be an easy aspect of things. So, um, um, this year's I did rod, we had, um, and we have a lot of people that are always asking us, are you retiring any dogs? We want one. We want one. We want one. And for the right people, a retired sled dog is a great pet. If you love to hike and you're active and that kind of thing and you're patient, there can be a great pet for you. And we had um, this dog, Uno, who I raced with and Christy raced with and then Andy raced with. And then he retired and a friend of ours had him as a pet and he recently passed on and she asked could you carry his ashes to gnome with you so you can i do i did around one more time and we did carry yeah. his she's, ashes yeah she's like if you feel like you know if there's mm-hmm. somewhere you want to scatter them she's like just listen to your heart whatever you want to do i want you to carry some of uno's ashes with yeah you. so uno did i did a rod with us and then we were at a tripod cabin and christy's like you know what susan butcher spirit guards old woman cabin on the way to you know cleat she's like we need another dog guiding spirit here at tripod cabin so we spread some of uno's ashes there and it was only the two of us at that cabin and that kind of thing and um right before christy scattered his ashes and we had the moment i said you and i haven't seen one shooting star this whole race and then we're like yeah i haven't either and that kind of thing and as we're leaving tripod i called the dogs on to the trail and i saw this glorious falling star i was like that's uno leading the way for us now so it was that was a kind of a tearjerker mm-hmm. kind of moment yeah wow that's um, yeah that is incredible um yeah it's got to be tough going through that but it's also uh you guys had an amazing journey journey together you and uno i'm sure and mm-hmm. all the dogs yeah. and you know it's much better to have that journey than not have had it at all yeah and yeah. uh and um yeah well we really appreciate y'all coming on um and brennan i think uh we can, we can call it. And we thank you so much for your time Anna and Christy. And, um, that was really, really fun getting to chat with you guys. And, uh, yeah, I hope to see more of you soon. Um, I'm going to be, I'll be away for most of summer, but maybe I'll see y'all in the autumn or something over in Knick. And and I was also going to say for anyone listening who isn't aware of how to follow you or support you or anything like that, can you guys just and excuse us for continuing to say, can you guys, can you, I'm so sorry. I I like, it's been in the back of my mind the entire time. I'm like, that's the fifth Uh, time I've done it. Damn it. Uh, Uh, it. (laughs) But it's still, you should, I I appreciate you being used to it, but we should be better. And I'm calling myself out. That's Um, fair. Me too. Yeah. 
It's it's because our parents are from New York. Not in a good excuse, but they're These always guys. like, hey, hey, These how you guys, doing? Hey. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> uh, y'all, that's why we have to stick to our Southern roots, Brendan. It's- I should <laughs> just say y'all, yeah. So can y'all please promote yourself and tell the, the listeners and or potential watchers on YouTube. Nike, Adidas. Where they can follow you. Our website is seeing double sled dog and um, our sister cat writes a really fun blog every year. We run, I did a rod and she's got some good facts and uh, is a really good, good doggy person. So she uh, is a real good promoter for us and she uh, handles our merchandise and swag. So if you want a t-shirt or uh, a hat or something, there's um, all sorts of goodies on the website and all those uh, proceeds go to, the mushing endeavors of seeing double yeah and also uh, at seeing double sled dog racing on instagram there's lots of fun pictures and year-round dog stuff yeah i have to say it was fun uh during the iditarod seeing the post from your sister she has a good time with with that role during the race so yes she does. <laughs> i just wanted to give give that a shout out for sure yeah thank you uh, but yeah, thank thank you both for being on. 